The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Lord. I'd like to start by sharing a poem with you called Christians. It was written by one of my favorite poets, Maya Angelou. Only somebody who knows what it is like to be pruned could have written this poem. It goes like this. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not shouting I'm clean living. I'm whispering I was lost, now I'm found and forgiven. When I say I am a Christian, I don't speak of this with pride. I'm confessing that I stumble and need Christ to be my guide. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not trying to be strong. I'm professing that I'm weak and need his strength to carry on. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not bragging of success. I'm admitting I have failed and need God to clean my mess. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not claiming to be perfect. My flaws are far too visible, but God believes I'm worth it. When I say I am a Christian, I still feel the sting of pain. I have my share of heartaches, so I call upon his name. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not holier than thou. I'm just a simple sinner who received God's good grace somehow. On the night before he died for us, Jesus said to his disciples, I am the vine, you are the branches. God is the vine grower, the gardener, the one who removes any branches that do not bear fruit. Every branch that does bear fruit is pruned to make it bear more fruit. Not that long ago, I got, I got pruned. It happened when Bishop John Bruno called me up out of the blue while I was visiting my mother in Detroit. Now, Bishop Bruno told me he was acting at the behest of the Holy Spirit when he asked me to serve half-time here at St. George's. Now, of course, if you know Bishop Bruno, you know he put it to me as if it were a request but he wasn't really asking. <laughs> Much to my surprise, in the months since, I've seen aspects of my life fall away. Aspects I had no idea needed to be pruned. New life has emerged. The new life Joyce announced to you this morning. And so I'm happy to say, I'm happy to be St. George's Vicar. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for putting your trust in me. I hope and pray that we will bear much fruit together. Some years ago, my friend Liz and I decided to go on a spiritual retreat. Now, the retreat leader asked us to write down one or two lies about ourselves we needed to get rid of. 
not ridiculous lies like, I'm a professional opera singer, or I just won the lottery, but the kind of lies we all tell ourselves. Lies that we know in our head really aren't true, but that our hearts, for some reason, hang on to. Some examples that might sound vaguely familiar are, if I was smarter or friendlier or a better person, my life would be easier. Or if things aren't going my way, I must have done something to deserve it. Or this, I don't have a problem with drugs or alcohol. <laughs> or this, if I wasn't so needy or noisy or nosy, then the abuse would stop. Lies that we live our lives by. Lies that we die little deaths by. And it isn't just individuals who believe these lies. Entire institutions live by them and die by them too. If only we started a new program, we would attract young families to the church. Or this, if we just returned to what we used to do, everything would be the same as it was back in the good old days. Or if we would just add one more worship service with cooler music, we would fill our pews. My friend Liz shared on the retreat that she was too old to start over, even though she desperately wanted and needed to, that she didn't have the energy or the smarts to follow her passion. Liz, who took a year out of her life to go and volunteer with Mother Teresa in Calcutta, one of my lies was that God couldn't really be calling me to ordain ministry. I had been struggling mightily against this call and with God for so long, as long as I could remember, because I was sure there were so many others that could do it better. <laughs> so many others who seemed holier and even nicer than I. <laughs> I mean, what if I couldn't do it? whatever it was that God was going to ask of me. Now, Liz and I knew, of course, in our heads that we couldn't have been given the vision or the passion or even the idea unless we were also given the ability to accomplish it. But the heart can get tangled up in lies. It's a bit like the way the disciples' minds and hearts get all tangled up, so much so that today's gospel is the seventh count them seventh, I am identifier that Jesus gives them. Can't you just imagine his frustration? I imagine a voice that sounds something like Morgan Freeman or James Earl Jones thundering out as Jesus does the verbal, verbal equivalent of, what, are you kidding me? To the disciples, he says, I am the bread of life. Stop getting caught up in the mechanics of the bread baking. And to the spiritually blind Pharisees, he says, stop keeping track of other people's misdeeds and quit trying to manage sin. I am the light of the world. To all of the religious authorities, he says, I am the gate. Stop trying to be God's bouncers. And he tells them all, I am the good shepherd. You are the hired hands, the thieves, the bandits. To Martha's and Mary's questions about their dead brother Lazarus, he says, I am resurrection and I am life. It isn't about life after death. It's about abundant life right now. It's what we've been doing this whole time together. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You've been following me all this time, and you still don't get this? And today, to us and to the disciples, he says that the way to stay connected with him is to let him be the vine and to understand that we are the branches. For years, well-known author and preacher Max Lucado said he viewed God as a compassionate boss and himself as a loyal sales representative. 
God had his office and I had my territory, he said. I could contact him as much as I wanted, but when it came to work, to family, and to going about the day-to-day -day life of a Christian, I was doing it on my own because I felt that I worked for God. Then one night he ran across 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, which says that we are God's fellow co-workers. Now he says that it is a wonderful day when we stop working for the Lord and start working with him. What is Jesus already doing at our jobs, in our homes, through our church, within our lives, and how might we become part of that? Which, of course, brings us to abiding. Jesus was trying to prepare the disciples for the hailstorm about to explode around them, his betrayal, the arrest, the trial, the crucifixion, his death and resurrection. He told them to convince them that even though he appeared to be gone, he would still be connected to them. He tried to tell them that they would abide in each other. This week I spoke with a priest named Reverend Millie. She has a ministry in North Carolina and she told me about her own kind of pruning story. While visiting Cuba, she encountered an amazing ministry, and so she started one just like it when she got home. <laughs> she called it Kairos West, and she said its mission is to aspire to be a sacred space in a secular world, to aspire to be a sacred space in a secular world, a space set apart to help build the community's capacity to thrive. I just love the way that sounds, to help build the community's capacity to thrive through art and through liturgy and service, through simply pro providing space for people to gather, to decrease competition and to increase collaboration, to decrease isolation and to increase connectivity for everyone. She said the intent is that connectivity is going to invite the Holy Spirit into our work more and more and more. And that's what we hear Jesus asking us to do, to be connected, to be connected, to be connected. I am the branch, you are the vine. Now, Reverend Millie's ministry was patterned after Kairos East, which is open 24-7 in Matanzas, in Cuba's interior. And it started simply as a place for people to come to get clean and fresh water to drink. Then they noticed that people came only for the water, but not much else. So they added space for conversation, for art, and for worship. And people began to gather there. They began to talk about what was happening in their homes, among their families, within their communities, and within the context of the changing life in Cuba. They began tackling solutions to local challenges and energizing one another and building the community's capacity to thrive. After witnessing Kairos East, Reverend Millie says that it just wouldn't let me go. It just kept hovering right over every other work I was doing. And now, just one year later, she has about two dozen community partners who share space. It is a place to connect, a place for art, for yoga, for farmer's market. She told me that it's the only place in the entire community that has free food. It's a place for worship, for community forums. Prayers are clipped to strings that hang from walls, from the ceiling rather, creating prayer walls. Reverend Millie also works for the cathedral in Asheville, and she says that that congregation has supported her all the way. It's an amazing thing to be willing to say, this is what we do, she says. We send people out into the world to start new things, to help communities flourish. Now, by the way, I'm happy to tell you that my friend Liz 
did change her life. She ended up at Harvard Medical School, and now she has a family practice with poor and indigent people. And she recently, just this year, started her own clinic. And as for me, here I am. <laughs> and I feel a strong sense of call to be right here, right now. It makes you wonder, doesn't it? What might happen in my life or in your life or in the life of St. George's if we were willing to let God prune us? What would happen if we strengthened our relationship with Jesus and allowed him to grow us and to grow in us and to abide with us and to abide within us? I tell you what, I will if you will. Let's find out together. Because I believe him when he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you abide in me, I will abide in you and you will bear much fruit. Amen. <laughs>